In this first section, uh, we are going to have a focus section on energy conversion materials and devices. Uh, my name is Yi Chui. I'm a faculty member and Department of Material Science at uh, Stanford University. I will be uh, uh, chairing this section. Um, before we start the formal uh, technical presentation, let me uh, give you an overview uh, to set up uh, the background uh, for you. Um, so let's look at the energy conversion process within GSAP. It's always very important to look at you know, what energy processes we are dealing with. If you look at the, how the energy flow, these uh, um, four types of fundamental carriers uh, exist, we think about you know, all the time. Photons, electrons, phonons, ions, atoms, and molecules. Uh, and energy conversion process involving oftentimes, probably nearly all the time, of thinking about how these uh, energy carriers you know, take the energy, convert it into something you're interested in. For example, this is where the solar cells and the LED, you know, uh, we should think about right here, electrons to photons, photons to electrons. And uh, electrons and ions, atoms and molecules, that's uh, the, for the batteries, for the uh, fuel cell, for the catalysis. Um, and electrons and phonons, we think about, you know, heating, cooling, thermoelectrics, and, and, and so on. So underlying this is really, uh, you know, uh, get this process going is the materials and devices. And to have the next generation of breakthrough technology, materials, devices, and their interface are the one, you know, we need to tackle all the time. So in the past, looking at the GSAP's uh, funding uh, uh, project, uh, uh, and uh, materials and devices are essential and for example, the batteries one, that's the one I, I work on uh, very closely, coming up new type of materials such as nanostructure to enable next generation of batteries. And catalysis, you know, uh, finding new materials, understanding their interface to make the catalytic process more efficient, having the low cost uh, catalyst uh, coming in. And a few cells, you know, uh, uh, how do you uh, enable, uh, you know, high power, efficient, uh, for example, oxygen moving and the solid oxide fuel cells right there. And interface control, and this example is a silicon passivated by really thin layer of um, titanium oxide using uh, atomic layer deposition. Uh, only a nanometer or two also can protect the semiconductor underneath, so nearly perfect interfacial control. And, and, and solar cells, how do you do photon management and uh, get the efficient solar cells? And new ideas, how to think about using a, a, you know, photo, a photo enhanced thermionic emission, you know, to enhance the uh, electron emission. Um, and a new type of uh, thermoelectric, so a new faculty uh, joining in, Arun is an expert on this. And uh, CO2 capture, you know, nitrogen dope, uh, carbon, for example, with, within the GSAP project. So these are some of the selected examples of uh, how important the materials and devices can play a role in the energy conversion. Um, now in this morning's talk, we have three select examples to look at uh, 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 problems in these areas. The first one is Professor Roger Howe. Um, he will be looking at, uh, you know, really control the interface, having ultra low work function. That facilitate the electron emission. And uh, Professor uh, uh, Robert Brown, uh, really looking at the device uh, and even the system level to rethink about what innovation you can do to have this new idea of solid oxide flow batteries. So it's like solid oxide fuel cells and the flow batteries are, you know, hybrid. And Professor Zhenan Bao um, and, uh, is looking at a new type of uh, polymer for uh, uh, next generation of batteries as well as, you know, CO2 uh, storage uh, capture. Uh, let me give you a quick overview of what might be included in uh, these three people's talk. So, um, uh, Roger, and uh, along with his uh, colleagues in the past several years, has been uh, working on this problem, trying to think about how do I take the electron out of a solid, 
you know, uh, with uh, minimum energy to tune the surface work function. That's the, the, uh, the, that's the, uh, the key thing of the game. And uh, in order to do that, so uh, he teamed up with uh, uh, Jens Noskov and, and doing a DFT calculation. Now to find the new materials, you can call on to the interface to enable ultra low work function, yet at the same time, still uh, maintain a, a, a stable uh, surface right there, allow you to really run the device over, over many, many cycles over the uh, long, uh, long term. And, and coupled together with this will be the experimental testing. So he will be telling you about this. Second example is uh, from uh, uh, Robert Brown. And, and these uh, um, schematic drawing pretty much giving you the idea, you know, and, and to do the marriage of fuel cells and uh, flow batteries. Now, when you do fuel cell, it's not, you don't think about rechargeable fuel cell. You just take the fuels coming in, convert it into electricity, and that's it. And the, uh, for the flow batteries, you can rechargeable back and forth. Unfortunately, those redox couples and the solution still very high cost, not enough energy density. Now, and, uh, uh, and Rob was told you are going to learn about, they are going to come on new type of fuels that's used in the solid oxide fuel cell, but can be done in a way like a flow battery rechargeable uh, of, uh, fuel cells. And uh, Zhenan will be talking about uh, you know, the polymer uh, uh, she's uh, applying into the new type of application. And, and one example is the cell healing ideas based on her uh, group's research in the past several years, how to do you do the skin cell healing using those ideas she uh, apply into the very challenging problem in, in the battery, for example, in the, in the case of silicon, volume expansion is huge, the breaking is a big problem, how do you use a uh, self-healing polymer? Even they break, but these uh, electrodes self-heal, maintain the um, uh, uh, long cycle life. So um, with this, let's uh, start with the first talk uh, by uh, Professor uh, uh, Roger Howe. Um, so let me just mention briefly Roger, uh, 10 seconds. Um, uh, Roger is a, a professor in uh, electrical engineering at Stanford University. So uh, we stole him away from Berkeley um, nearly 10 years ago. Um, and did he and I joined the Stanford faculty at the same time. We all migrated from uh, Berkeley to Stanford. Um, so um, he's uh, certainly an expert in MEMS. Uh, uh, several years ago, he uh, started to work on energy problem. That's uh, when he started this uh, uh, you know, thermionic emission idea. He's a member of National Academy of Engineering. Roger. Thanks. Good morning. It's um, uh, uh, early and in fact uh, we have competition. Uh, my colleague in electrical engineering Eric Pop is doing Thermoelectrics 101, a uh, short course uh, in parallel. Uh, this is um, in fact a, a, a research uh, project with Jens Norskoff in uh, chemical engineering and Piero Pianetta in uh, uh, SLAC and EE. The, the target however is not thermoelectrics with our low work functions, it's thermionics. So, uh, uh, let's uh, uh, dive in, and I'm going to give you some motivation and background because, in fact, uh, thermoelectrics are a well-known technology uh, advancing uh, through the efforts of uh, 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 GSEP funding, uh, making a major impact. Uh, what about uh, uh, thermionics? It's a century-old technology. There is a, um, it's basically a diode. The anode or collector's work function is, is critical. Uh, in uh, the efficiency of this device, and that would be a target. Uh, there's also the uh, emitter or cathode, and that work function uh, is, is somewhat less critical, but some of this work could be dual use uh, for either uh, electrode. Uh, we've uh, spent a lot of time working on uh, alkali earths and, and computational modeling. Uh, also some breakthroughs in uh, modeling the emission current from first principles, which is a, a first uh, in addition to the uh, work function. Sometimes you have a, a material with a superb work function, but an incredibly lousy uh, emission current density. So that, uh, the ability to compute that is important. We're working on some alternative anode approaches, and I'd like to wrap up with uh, future pro prospects for uh, thermionic energy. 
So here uh, is an expanded view of this uh, uh, very simple idea of heating uh, uh, typically a metal, uh, though I'll uh, indicate some uh, uh, breakthroughs and alternatives to metals uh, for the uh, cathode, uh, and uh, simply collecting those emitted electrodes at a, at a material at a different temperature, cooler temperature, and different uh, work function. You have uh, something that uh, looks like uh, uh, a, a photovoltaic cell in that it gives low voltage and high current. Uh, if we do our energy band diagram, uh, we see that our output voltage, ideally, with no uh, losses, would be the difference between the emitter and collector uh, work functions. Therefore, the collector or anode work function uh, needs to be minimized. Uh, the Richardson-Dushman law uh, uh, developed uh, in the previous century, uh, that constant A is important as well on the, uh, on the cathode. Um, there are uh, issues in radiative heat transfer I'll go into in a minute because of the large temperature difference. Um, there's also losses through the leads, through the interconnects that would uh, hurt your efficiency. So through the 20th century, there, were, uh, there was a tremendous uh, development in thermionic uh, converters. The basic concept, uh, Schlichter in his PhD thesis at Tübingen almost 100 years ago, uh, introduced in an appendix uh, the concept of a, the thermionic converter. Uh, Soviet uh, researchers in 1941, uh, in fact, uh, the first uh, work is in World War I and the second in World War II, uh, under interesting uh, conditions, no doubt. Uh, but they uh, did a lab demonstration, uh, and after the war, tremendous uh, efforts in uh, the U.S. and uh, Soviet Union for uh, space power uh, using nuclear pile sources. But efficiencies were achieved uh, of uh, 5 to 10 percent. <clears throat> Ultimately, um, there was a conference in 1968 where the communities decided they were efficient enough at 20 percent uh, for their uh, uh, space applications. Um, just to show you that these uh, existed, uh, the, this is a Topaz II built uh, by the Soviet Union, flown uh, 27 years ago on a naval reconnaissance satellite, and uh, it's a six kilowatt uh, nuclear reactor uh, wrapped with a thermionic converter. Some materials issues being wrapped around a nuclear pile. Uh, and in fact, after the Cold War, we leased uh, a dozen of these and tested them. Uh, this is a photograph of uh, a US plane with a Soviet uh, converter. So in any case, <clears throat> in the 21st, century, we do have very high temperature sources of heat. This is a concentrated solar plant in Spain. And we have, uh, in fact, the Ivanpah CSP plant that's uh, come online in, <clears throat> in the Mojave Desert uh, 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 this year in March. And so uh, perhaps uh, this needs to be revisited. Um, <clears throat> after the Cold War, this is a capsulated perspective, uh, the um, uh, technology uh, uh, developed uh, was uh, tungsten with uh, adsorb cesium uh, to lower the work function. Uh, the electrode gaps were held at a, a hundred microns, a tenth of a millimeter over large uh, areas. I'm sure there were heroes of Soviet labor for the machinists on these uh, projects. This was um, uh, done in an era where cost was not an issue. Uh, observing U.S. ships on the dark side of the Earth was an issue for the Soviet Union and, and also for the U.S. Um, lots of work around. So uh, in any event, there was a, a, a study, uh, Thermionics Covatus, uh, uh, that looked at this uh, about uh, 13 years ago, and I'll reference that in a minute. Um, so I, um, uh, we, we've had a wonderful collaboration uh, under GSEP funding and, in fact, other uh, investigators that would be involved. Uh, this would uh, be a paper uh, with Nick Malosh and my former postdoc, uh, Igor Bargatin. Jay Lee is a uh, uh, grad student, uh, wrapped up his PhD last year, where we looked at the optimal electrode gaps. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the 100 micron gap, you would have space charge issues that they battled. Uh, we can make gaps uh, using MEMS technology well below a micron. Uh, is that desirable? Turns out that you have these near field heat transfer effects and you get thermal shorting. So there should be a, an optimum. And uh, Murphy must have been asleep because the, uh, the gap of 1 to 10 microns is something that is like falling off a log uh, for people making gyroscopes and accelerometers, which I spent a good part of my early career, <clears throat> silicon gyroscopes and accelerometers using 
MEMS technology. So um, uh, in fact, that's great. We can make it possibly in technology that would drop the cost orders of magnitude uh, using uh, wafer scale fabrication. However, I referenced that thermionics Cobatis report. Uh, in that report, there was early, not late 90s work on a wafer bonded thermionic concept uh, at Sandia National Labs. The criticism of the uh, panel uh, was that uh, the heat uh, thermal isolation would be a showstopper. You have differences in temperature of 500 Kelvin or more gaps of a micron, you have tremendous gradients. How on earth can you possibly uh, have that kind of uh, uh, gradient? You'll have a th uh, thermal losses will we'll make this inefficient. Well, um, uh, in fact, um, uh, I've been on these panels. It's uh, interesting to make this kind of quote because you can always cover yourself by saying you were sort of provoking people. You know, you knew that this wasn't the case, but why not? Uh, uh, you know, jab the uh, community. Uh, in fact, uh, thermal isolation micro platforms are, have been well known uh, since the 80s and 90s. Uh, bolometers are a very hot commercial topic for infrared uh, cameras for automobiles. They're made using these suspended platforms and the detection temperatures are millikelvin. Uh, you're thermally isolated from the substrate. And in fact, uh, uh, these uh, are fabricated using the kind of micro-machining technologies that uh, would be uh, the subject of basic grad courses at, uh, at Stanford. Um, in fact, we've applied that technology to make a suspended structure uh, out of silicon carbide with no uh, uh, special uh, 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 no tungsten, no work function coatings, just as an existence proof. And uh, in fact, uh, we, we uh, uh, ran it as a converter using the sub, uh, silicon substrate as the anode. Um, uh, what would the converter look like on the Ivanpah Tower? Massive arrays of pixels, uh, uh, possibly individually addressable. Uh, EEs uh, like that idea. Uh, we can do some interesting things with access to that, at that level. So uh, actually, optical heating of this, uh, we don't have any problem uh, going incandescent and keeping the substrate quite cool. Uh, and so thermal isolation uh, in a vacuum is a non uh, issue. In fact, vacuum um, is also a non-issue. I think there, there may be some uh, interesting uh, practical challenges for long-term reliability, but in your pocket you have a, a gyroscope chip, if you have an iPhone, uh, that would be made using wafer-bonded seals uh, using uh, uh, basically uh, a variant of MEMS technology. So uh, the, the um, ability to fabricate this is uh, not a problem in principle from my perspective. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the materials, uh, silicon carbide is not a candidate. It may be a structural material. If you look at the efficiency of uh, uh, the um, thermionic converter with a cathode temperature on the x-axis and efficiency, the, uh, these are ideal efficiencies without losses. This is the collector or anode work function. Going to very low work functions is important. Nanocrystalline diamond has been under one electron volt. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, we have, uh, 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 will report things that are on the order of one EV. And these efficiencies are, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, in, in context, we may be a topping cycle on that Ivanpah plant. We may not have to replace the conventional heat engine. Our reject temperature could be quite high. So in any case, how do we find these materials? And now we get to this particular critically important GSEP uh, uh, grant um, uh, because, in fact, uh, people have made, uh, there's a whole industry with electron sources, SEMs, electron beam lithography, instruments of all kinds, and uh, these are often made with a tungsten uh, base metal, typically not crystalline, coated with a mixed oxide, uh, alkali earths, barium, strontium, calcium, uh, sort of mixed up in, uh, uh, in a mortar and pestle kind of fashion in some cases and, and uh, deposited in interesting ways uh, with uh, uh, migration uh, into, into the grain boundaries and ultimately uh, a very complex process leading to electron emission and low effective work function. So what um, uh, this project uh, proposed to do is look at this from a systematic point of view and uh, in fact, we have the um, uh, question of where to start. Uh, the most favorable, most stable configurations uh, have, in fact, uh, the x equals 4. And so we focused on those. 
Um, I will go into a lot of simulation in the next uh, slides. It's uh, just recently been in the literature with several uh, papers uh, uh, with my student Sharon Chow as the lead author. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, but, but in context, uh, uh, the fabrication technology where you would engineer the composition of these uh, would be, uh, uh, in, in, from my perspective, done using the atomic layer deposition, which is a very powerful tool. Uh, we are currently depositing strontium oxide on uh, tungsten, as a, as a, a, for example, but there's work in the literature where you would nanolaminate these materials between strontium and barium and, and calcium, and uh, uh, then uh, do post-processing to center and dial in that composition uh, uh, very, very uh, tightly. So focusing on, on, uh, on this set, we still have a lot of, uh, a lot of simulation to do uh, because we have uh, our, our basic uh, alkali earth is calcium, strontium, or barium, and we can dope that. In the literature, there's uh, a lot of work on uh, adding things, lithium and, and other uh, metals. So uh, what um, <clears throat> um, uh, is, is uh, showing here is a, is a virtual uh, atom uh, that uh, could be a blended uh, composition of the uh, pseudo potentials of these uh, three atoms as a, as a shortcut. And, uh, <clears throat> Obviously, the unit cell that's being simulated is important to minimize that, uh, and it was uh, very important to have access to the SunCat uh, cluster up at uh, SLAC that Jens Norskopf would be in charge of. This is a very serious, big, uh, uh, big iron kind of uh, uh, computer. So uh, if we uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, what uh, we have this uh, uh, unit cell, uh, what we uh, would like to do is identify dopants that would um, uh, dopants and compositions that would uh, drive us in two directions. We want very large negative formation energies for stability. Uh, there are things like dispenser cathodes that spew out uh, some of these materials. We want a rock solid, uh, uh, stable material. Ideally, for those that are, are in the electron emission business, we would not want cesium in this. Uh, that's a difficult material to, to deal with, and, and can we do it with simply our mixed oxides? So we're uh, driving in a direction of low work function and uh, stable uh, formation energy. And if you look at the various dopants we can add, uh, they have effects that would uh, 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 often be useful. So we would be uh, focusing on ones like uh, scandium and lithium uh, that would um, uh, make this uh, 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 material uh, uh, more, more interesting as an emitter. So there, we're, we're faced with a large uh, triangle uh, uh, of uh, potential compositions. Uh, and uh, how, does, how to deal with these simulations? Well, Sharon Chow, uh, my uh, uh, first student who has not gone into a bunny suit into the uh, uh, nanofab in my entire career, though an EE, uh, uh, looked um, uh, at uh, basically doing it brute force uh, with the actual atoms and uh, expanding the unit cell. And this um, leads to around a week uh, runtime. Uh, the virtual crystal approximation shrinks the cell and uh, you get uh, down to hours. And in fact, uh, the differences uh, in, in some test cases are rather minimal. So there's an incentive to just uh, get started. And, uh, and of course, the, the blending of these pseudopotentials is very important in order to get uh, 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 the both computational feasibility and uh, benchmarking against experiment uh, uh, to get accuracy. So uh, Sharon's process would be, would be to get the atomic orbitals, generate smooth pseudopotentials from uh, uh, th uh, these uh, uh, orbitals, check the answer, reformulate, and repeat. <laughs> Uh, fortunately, you can write scripts to do this, assuming SunCat isn't crashed by your activities. And uh, she did have her hand slapped for excessive uh, uh, consumption of uh, Slack's computing resources. Nevertheless, it was a, a, a very, very interesting result. Uh, what, what are we showing? Uh, we have um, the pure mixed oxides with all compositions, uh, uh, with work functions and formation energies adding scandium and lithium doping. And this is work functions and stability's 570 total combinations. 
So what this does is short circuit a massive amount of experimentation. And uh, 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 at the uh, Three Beams Conference, uh, which is where the electron beam people hang out, uh, this is uh, uh, of, ex of great interest. Uh, they have been mining the, this for a number of years using uh, 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 technologies that are not as controlled as ALD. And so, uh, in fact, if you look at uh, uh, the pure films, it, it looks uh, uh, like you uh, can benefit um, going to, uh, uh, and so I'm, I'm mapping pure barium oxide and uh, a work function of around one and a half. And um, in fact, uh, if you look at um, uh, what calcium is doing, Calcium, uh, the addition of calcium is, in fact, uh, 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 driving the work function higher. Um, however, it's making the formation energy lower. So it's a, a kind of counter effect. And so you, you may be able to see adding a pinch of calcium uh, to get that surface stability while maintaining the low work function. Now, there is an experimental ratio here from a, a paper uh, about 13 uh, years ago. Uh, and so we would be um, uh, uh, benchmarking in the very limited experimental data. A lot of this is proprietary, actually, in the uh, uh, industry. So if we add lithium, we can uh, get uh, work functions of 1.2 EV and as stable uh, as the pure material. I'm going to click through this uh, quickly. The, um, uh, and, and so it looks like we have something that could be a potential candidate for a, ca a, a cathode material or an anode material. The um, uh, understanding of this, um, I'm going to uh, look at, uh, 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 you can read the details in the paper, uh, work function as, effect, as a function of the effective offset of the uh, uh, this, uh, uh, synthetic atom from the oxygen at the surface. And uh, in fact, that uh, could be uh, a physical insight in how you can control the work function. So, uh, in any case, where are we okay, in, the, in this? Uh, this was uh, shown earlier. Uh, if we indicate our lowest work function at 1.15, uh, we are getting uh, efficiencies that are in the range of 30% ideally. Uh, again, uh, we may not be rejecting the heat at 300 Kelvin. It may be a topping cycle. But uh, compared to their initial uh, work functions and without cesium, uh, I think this is a very important breakthrough. We would uh, uh, be gearing up uh, to do this experimentally. Um, uh, a, uh, uh, along the way, uh, there were a lot of discussions on the inability to simulate the current density using density functional theory. Johannes Voss at uh, SLAC uh, and uh, Frank Abiel uh, Peterson uh, developed a way of extending the, um, uh, the uh, uh, supercell into the vacuum and, and, uh, and adding a decoupling region to the lead, to the interconnect, and essentially first principle simulating the current and benchmarking that against experiment. So now we have the whole uh, basic function of that uh, 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 high temperature material, work function and richardson dushman coefficient uh, for the first time on the, um, uh, 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 our ability is to simulate that to compute before we uh, do the fabrication. Uh, lastly, another paper with Johannes would uh, look at the uh, lanthanum hexaboride, which is a standard uh, uh, cathode material uh, with a, a layer of um, barium hexaboride. You're able to lower the work function by 400 millivolts uh, without any uh, dipole barrier. So um, one challenge in, in uh, talking over uh, uh, with, you know, can we go synthesize this, uh, that um, uh, has proven to be challenging to, to do what would amount to be a, uh, an epitaxy of a monolayer uh, is, is it currently beyond our technology. But this would point in a, in a uh, new direction uh, for getting uh, materials that uh, are, are fundamentally higher performance, maybe lowering the working temperature substantially. Finally, we've, we've worked on other ways to lower work functions. Uh, this is um, 
um, uh, uh, you know, as an electrical engineer, we think, well, we must be able to mess around with this using some gate or something to get what we want. Unfortunately, in a three-dimensional material, uh, we, 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 of course, can do what we've been doing, lowering the vacuum level using surface coatings. Maybe we can raise the Fermi level. Uh, it doesn't work in 3D materials, but it does work in 2D materials. In, in uh, Philip Kim's group at Columbia, this was shown for transistors. So my uh, student Hong Yuan Yuan is uh, working on doing this for thermionics where we would have a, uh, a control through the substrate to do what we call electrostatic doping of the graphene, raising the Fermi level and lowering the work function. So we've been working on this with uh, uh, tremendous experimental uh, challenges to get uh, high quality graphene. And over the, uh, 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 over the summer, Hong Yuan using a Kelvin probe has been able to show a very substantial uh, shift in uh, work function. And uh, at, at SLAC, uh, we're not getting quite the same shift, but still a much larger shift than, than has been shown in the literature. Uh, we have a larger uh, spot size, and the uh, graphene isn't uh, 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 perfect. So uh, finally, uh, we are building up a, a, a test station for microthermionic converters. Uh, this is the SolidWorks drawing. Uh, Hong Yuan's a physics uh, student, but uh, has come up to speed in vacuum technology. All told, in our multiple groups, we have five chambers for testing these. This is a new one. And, um, and so wrapping up, what are the prospects for wafer scale thermionic energy converters? I'll say wafer scale, these uh, uh, chip-based technology, MEMS technology, well, I think they're very simple devices uh, that uh, uh, have some very challenging materials uh, issues, high temperatures. Uh, there would be a large push in MEMS to go uh, embrace silicon carbide. Uh, my colleague Debbie Sineski in Aero and Astro would be working on high temperature sensors for uh, combustion and uh, 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 gas turbines. Uh, that technology very much overlaps with what we would need in thermionics. Um, uh, so I don't think the technology is an issue. I think the, the, the GSEP project has made a huge whack at the materials challenges and kicked off something very, I think, very exciting. Nick Malosh isn't here today because he's in Houston at a NASA conference on thermionic energy conversion. Uh, that would be uh, where I would be if I wasn't giving this talk as well. Because I think what has been happening in, in GSEP and overlapping uh, pro projects is uh, uh, very exciting. So um, lastly, the photon enhanced thermionic energy converter, which was Nick and his student Jared's uh, Schwede's invention a few years ago, uh, would use a semiconducting photocathode. All of this work on the anode is valuable. Uh, uh, for the peat converter as well as the straight thermionic converter, as we, as we call it. So uh, that is an uh, uh, exciting thing. So uh, I'd like to wrap up. Uh, GSEP has played a critical role uh, in, uh, in enabling this uh, uh, simulation project. Uh, Frank Abild Peterson, a senior author, uh, the resources of <coughs> Yen's group in Sun Cat have been critical. Uh, and my group on the experimental side, uh, Sharon is now at First Fuel, uh, an uh, energy efficiency company. She finished her PhD. Uh, Igor is a professor. Jay, uh, a CEO of a startup. And uh, Nick and ZX's group uh, would be uh, 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 part. We have a large uh, uh, overall thermionics meeting and separate meetings. This has been a very exciting uh, research project. And GSEP has been absolutely critical to uh, kicking this off. Thank you. <clears throat> so, How big a role does radiation heat loss play between the emitter and the collector? It, um, <clears throat> it's certainly always there, but it, it is a tremendously strong function of the gap. Uh, there are, uh, uh, you know, there's sort of classical radiative heat loss, and then there are these near-field effects that have been modeled in, the, in recent years. And uh, we are uh, comfortable in this 1 to 10 micron range. Uh, but um, uh, going close, closer than a micron, and it actually uh, will short out your, your converter. You won't be able, you'll, you'll have such uh, radiative losses uh, that you uh, uh, don't have any efficiency. Uh, but it's, it's not a sh complete show sh showstopper by any, any means. 
<clears throat> if you treat it as a topping cycle, is it the same efficiency just with a smaller uh, amount of the energy, or do you actually increase the efficiency for like basically that portion of the energy that you're going after? It would be an interesting complex optimization problem. And uh, uh, we went up, uh, Nick uh, and I, to uh, BrightSource, uh, the mm -hmm. Ivan Paw designers, and they would be very interested on when this is coming online. There's tremendous efforts on the primary heat engine. If you have from left field something out of uh, almost the semiconductor industry that you could uh, put on, the, on that tower as a topping cycle, maybe it takes some pressure off them. But uh, uh, the numbers would be really encouraging if you give it a, even a 15% boost. Uh, that, that really matters. Um, uh, so it's a, uh, a work in uh, progress. I might mention that uh, Jared has won something uh, interesting from the Department of Energy, the M37 uh, program at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab for incubating uh, ideas that need more time uh, but have tremendous commercial progress, so he, uh, pro uh, promise rather, and he uh, uh, proposed uh, thermionic converters and, and won. And so he's looking forward to wrapping up his PhD and heading up there, possibly with Dan Riley tagging along. <laughs> he's in, in uh, Nick's group. So I think it's um, uh, something that I, I have uh, spent a lot of time talking on the overall picture because perhaps uh, uh, that might be not as familiar as other energy conversion. Uh, uh, with the centenary coming up next year, I think it's uh, high time that we uh, 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 really uh, apply some push in this as a complement to uh, uh, other uh, uh, energy conversion uh, technologies. So. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> so the block bin idea is really interesting. Using the, can you hear me? We, we have the, the chairs, oh, we, uh, can. <laughs> so the uh, graphene idea is pretty interesting, using the gating mm -hmm. to change the work function. Uh, how much can you do at the end? Uh, because of gate coupling, eventually uh, will have a limit, yeah. Well, it, um, it would be with this, and I forgot to mention, that wasn't, it had no dipoles or anything, so the work function is way too high in, in graphene uh, to vacuum. We need to put something on it to drop the work function, then yank it around electrostatically. Um, <clears throat> we think we can uh, get under one EV. Uh, so, uh, the, and the voltages needed were not particularly high. Uh, and there's no current, of course, if you know, and, and the anode is relatively cool, so you don't have to envision this operating at uh, outrageously high temperatures. Uh, Hong Yuan is uh, uh, very much interested in, in uh, pushing that. Well, okay. let's thank the <coughs> logic again. So the next talk is by Professor uh, Rob Brown from uh, uh, Colorado School of Mines. He's cu currently associate professor in mechanical engineering. Um, his uh, experience, uh, compared to most academias, uh, uh, is unique. Uh, he worked in industry for uh, 10 years, and uh, he's going to tell us about this uh, new idea of uh, normal solid oxide flow batteries. Rob. Okay, so uh, thank you for that introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here and be able to give you an update on our GSEP project on solid oxide flow batteries uh, for grid energy storage. A couple years back, we, we gave a talk as well on the cell material advancements we've been working on. Uh, today's talk, we're gonna focus more on the system concepts uh, that will hopefully enable the technology uh, to move it forward. Uh, before moving into that, I just wanna acknowledge our, our team members, uh, PhD student Chris Wendell and Professor Bob Key at the School of Mines, uh, Professor Scott Barnett and, and Drs. Uh, Gareth Hughes and, and Zan Gao at, at Northwestern who are really working uh, uh, at advancing the cell technology. So in today's talk, um, I'm going to briefly give you a, uh, an overview of what exactly is this technology uh, and followed by with, uh, I guess I would say, our view of some of the motivation uh, and the technology requirements uh, that are needed for energy storage to move forward. 
Uh, I'll then move into uh, some descriptions of reversible solid oxide uh, cells as flow batteries. Here we'll look at a little bit at the theory of operation and performance considerations, as well as some performance estimates of really these large scale, megawatt size, gigawatt hours capacity uh, systems that we would envision for, for bulk storage. Brief, I'll give a brief update of some of the exciting developments in the cell uh, development area where we we're really trying to push towards a 600C operation cell using LSGM technology. We have some very interesting and encouraging results related to, to cycling to show uh, of these cells. And that's very important when we're going to operate forward and backward modes with this technology. Uh, we don't want degradation there. Uh, lastly, uh, we'll, we'll touch on some of the economic projections uh, for these kind of large-scale bulk uh, energy storage uh, systems. Uh, I'll then briefly touch a little bit on what we've learned in, in future directions. So in principle, a solid oxide flow battery really leverages uh, similarities to fuel cells uh, where we're going to operate reversibly. Here, reversibly is not in the thermodynamic sense. It's in the sense of reversing the current uh, for these systems to operate in a power producing mode and in an electrolysis or charging mode. And we're, we're going to tank the reactants and, and capture uh, those in, in gaseous storage. And that's particularly useful for us because it gives us really the flow battery advantage. We get to decouple uh, power capacity um, from storage. And so the power will scale with the size of the cell stack and the energies will scale with the size of the storage tanks. We also get the high uh, efficiency advantage of solid oxide cell technology, uh, which enables us to have really high round trip efficiencies as we move between modes. We don't experience high polarization in electrolysis mode. And the novel, relatively novel HCO chemistry that is experienced directly within the cell allows us to, to produce high energy dense fuels. So shown here is a, is a, a real simple schematic of, of a solid oxide cell, an oxygen conducting one, uh, with some fuel storage. Here we're showing methane and syngas. And uh, we're going to feed it with air, and we're going to take the oxygen from air, reduce it, get those anions uh, moving, and electrochemically oxidize uh, those gaseous reactants into H2O and CO2. We will capture that tail gas in a tank and essentially produce our power. Now, in reverse mode, we can then accept, uh, apply voltage, drive a current, essentially put our power into the, the device, and then move into the opposite mode where we'll remove those previous products of reaction uh, out of storage, back to our cell, we'll strip out the oxygen, uh, liberate some of that oxygen, and in the meantime, directly within the cell, we will produce methane and, and syngas. Uh, in general, that will give us favorable scaling this device, but also uh, something additionally unique is it gives us really low cost working fluids compared to uh, advanced uh, and other types of flow batteries. In terms of motivation, certainly the variability of renewable energy resources is, is well known and motivates uh, developing grid energy solutions. Uh, I like to uh, at least see some picture of what that means. Here are some minute by minute data shown from Hawaiian Electric Power on a wind farm. Uh, we can see really a 10x change within 30 minutes of, of the power requirements. And it's not just wind variability. If we look at developing activities and concentrating solar power and, of course, PV penetration, you've got power fall off uh, in, in the evening hours as well that will, will need to be addressed to get high capacity factors. So currently, there is no battery technology that really serves. Uh, most of our energy storage uh, worldwide is predominantly pumped hydro. Uh, and that's, but this problem still exists, and uh, those uh, who are facing this, primarily often island nations, for example, are already trying to develop solutions, and I will call them poor solutions, taking high-grade electrical energy and storing it in low-grade hot water, for example, a so-called thermal battery. Uh, that's being done by Hawaiian Electric Power to, to manage these, this variability. Uh, it's also being done in electricity arbitrage models in Minnesota, for example, I would call them the the dubious honor of having the largest thermal battery perhaps in the country at one gigawatt hours, high grade electrical energy, low grade hot water, it's essentially thermodynamic sin. Uh, but in, on the other hand, uh, you know, good economics doesn't necessarily always mean good thermodynamics. 
in general, though, to, in order to enable that technology, we've got to uh, reach some certain targets. We've been keeping our eye on these as we look at this technology, certainly capital costs and round-trip efficiency, but perhaps most importantly, some levelized cost of electricity storage around a dime uh, per kilowatt hour cycle. Uh, we need cycle capability, and depending on the application, you'll need various modes, uh, various duration of storage. If we now turn uh, to looking at the technology itself, uh, just operationally, we can uh, take a look at a voltage current plot, which is a representation of the cell's performance characteristic. And shown here, we can see uh, that in power producing mode or fuel cell mode, uh, the voltage will decrease as you increase the current density or, or produce uh, more power in response to, to over potentials and irreversibilities within the cell. Uh, the slope of this curve uh, represents the overall resistance. In fuel cell mode, the higher the voltage, the higher the efficiency. In electrolysis mode, we can see a rel relatively smooth transition shown here in this cartoon, but that's actually what we see experimentally as well. Uh, there isn't a large over potential that gives us good electrolysis uh, efficiencies, uh, low applied voltage needed there. Uh, but here you want low voltage equals high efficiency in electrolysis mode. So if we look at the round trip stack efficiency, which is not shown here, okay, um, is basically the voltage of the fuel cell divided by the voltage uh, of the electrolysis device. That's the ratio. So you want high fuel cell voltage, low electrolysis voltage, that will give you a high round trip efficiency. At the system level, um, we not only need to be mindful of the stack, but we're moving these reactants back and forth between the tank and the stack, and so there's an auxiliary power component that enters into this ratio. So in the end, how we can improve system efficiency, we can improve the cell, uh, by reducing over potential, and at the system level, we've got to be mindful of the balance of plant and thermal management. And when we look at thermal management, one of the unique attributes here is by doing methanation locally within the cell in, a, in an electrolysis mode, uh, we're, we're able to attain low electrolysis voltages, get towards a thermal neutral operation uh, as well. So when we look at a fuel cell, it requires heat rejection, we're air cooled. Uh, we're operating at relatively high temperatures, but in electrolysis, this is of course an endothermic process. It requires a heat source, as, and we can see that when we reduce H2O, that's, that's certainly the case. Uh, we're going to leverage uh, HCO chemistry here, and because of the nickel in, in the, in the uh, fuel electrode, uh, we can also do heterogeneous uh, chemical reactions and reduce CO2 as well through uh, H2 and provide us with some CO, which can then be combined with hydrogen to methanate, which is highly exothermic. Okay? And that's very nice for us because we have an exothermic local source where we have an endothermic process. We've got good matching of sources and sinks there. And ultimately, low temperature is what we would want and relatively high pressure uh, to achieve that methanation. One of the considerations we're faced with as well is if we're going to design one of these systems, what do we charge the tanks with? What is the composition we want? And what are the considerations therein? So in these systems, we have to be concerned about carbon deposition. This is a deleterious effect on, on, on solid oxide cells. Uh, and it degrades their performance rapidly should that happen. So shown here is uh, in the right is essentially a compositional space used in a so-called Gibbs diagram or ternary diagram, where the shaded area above the red indicates the thermodynamically favorable region for carbon deposition to occur. And the, the open, the white zone really is, uh, is unfavorable for that, and that's where we want to operate. So uh, in doing so, you can see the red dot up here is uh, where we might start on a hydrogen-carbon ratio, uh, oxygen ratio for, for fuel cell mode. As we oxidize the fuel, we'll move towards this fully oxidized region shown in the light blue. And we don't really want to be fully oxidized. In this system, we want to be not fully oxidized and not fully reduced. This is our operating window, if you will, to move back and forth. Uh, if we look at the bottom graph, we can see basically on the left-hand side uh, equilibrium gas constitution on a molar basis. It's, it's a wet basis shown here uh, versus oxygen content. And we can basically move back and forth uh, between 
shown here is between 4 and 40 percent uh, oxygen conversion, which will allow us to uh, have fairly high storage capacity. Uh, we can produce uh, methane uh, in a 60-40 ratio with hydrogen here on a dry basis. And at this end of the cell, so basically as you produce in fuel cell mode, you'll see us reducing the CH4, producing H2O. These, of course, will be tanked for electrolysis mode. So one of the proposed uh, applications we've been looking at is really bulk storage. Uh, to, in order to get there, we need very large tanks. And very large tanks can be realized with pressurized underground gaseous uh, storage of our reactants uh, using salt caverns, for example, natural gas reservoirs, saline aquifers. Uh, and so we're, this concept is actually being very seriously considered, particularly in Europe, um, in, in Germany. Um, and we're looking in collaboration with the Danish Technical University uh, at, at designing the so-called surface system, which will, will convert uh, and store our reactants uh, using uh, survey data on natural gas uh, reservoirs in Denmark, for example. Uh, we can estimate 500 gigawatt hours of storage would be available for one plant that has a 250 megawatt capacity. And the punchline here is, we'll get to this later, but uh, in the end, these storage costs can reach three to four cents per kilowatt hour with storage durations of months, uh, which is particularly important. Germany in particular is very interested in month-long duration storage um, because of the low uh, PV uh, insulation and during the winter in particular. Because we produce methane, uh, we find it really interesting that the technology is also suitable uh, to support the so-called power-to-gas platforms that are very uh, of, of increasing interest, uh, in, particularly by Europe, in getting off of Russian natural gas and using renewable uh, green electricity, if you will, to make SNG. Uh, this technology is perfectly applicable uh, to that. In the end, though, we need this top surface system, and uh, that involves systems integration and thermal management strategies uh, in moving, essentially, uh, between uh, the caverns and the stack. And so just very briefly, we, we have to pressurize and preheat the reactants to get over to, to the stack. Uh, we can recover some of that energy from fuel cell exothermic operation uh, to reduce our balance of plant parasitics. Um, from the cavern, we'll take our CH4 preheated and expand it because it's operating at, say, 160 bar and the stack is at 20 bar. We'll recuperate some power and we'll, we'll introduce steam and use uh, the tail gas, if you will, of that process to meet uh, process heating needs before dumping it into the CO2 cavern. Uh, we'll get DC power out, and when we go to electrolysis mode, we basically reverse and, and store in the CO2 cavern, uh, store in the CH4 caverns. Um, importantly, in order to make this viable, we want to use the same equipment. Okay, so that means they have to be sized and operated and designed such that that can be done. We also have to carefully manage water in these systems. We're going to knock it out and generate it because we can't really easily store it in these caverns and, and extract it. When we look at performance trades, uh, clearly a key issue is what pressure and temperature should this stack be operated out. Uh, one of the things we like about this project is we got cell material development, we got systems aspects going on, and the two get to talk to each other, we can say from a systems view, I don't really need very low temperature, or I need a different pressure for you guys to focus on, perhaps, depending on the application. So here we show a, a plot of, of round trip efficiency for the stack and the system. We'll just focus on that versus stack pressure. And we see an optima is, is, is here. And that optima basically is the interplay between um, the, the auxiliary power uh, depending on what the stack pressure is. So if the stack pressure is relatively low, uh, we can get net power uh, out of our system in fuel cell mode, and that can offset our, our electrolysis uh, pumping requirements. In the end, that interplay gives us an optimum of around 20 bar, which we like because that matches uh, a lot of the high pressure turbine spools that are available uh, that might be integrated with the system. Similar trades are, are present when we look at temperature uh, and reactant utilization. And, and those optima are shown here. If we just quickly move into uh, now uh, looking at some of the cell uh, technology advancements that, are, that have been ongoing with this project, uh, we're really focused on these next generation material sets, leveraging 
uh, really LSGM technology to push towards 600C and, and with high cycle uh, durability. Um, briefly, here's an SEM uh, image uh, of the microstructure of one of the cells, and you can see the thick uh, LSGM electrolyte layer, uh, the dense layer that's, that's right here. Uh, overall, the, the sum of these layers is quite thin, uh, but you can see here uh, there is, uh, on the air, air electrode, we have our gas diffusion support, it's LSF. Uh, we have a nickel infiltrated uh, LSGM fuel electrode that allows us to get high uh, uh, current densities uh, for a uh, high triple phase boundary uh, area, if you will. This is on an SLT support, which gives it strength, and one of the, the unique pieces of this is, is the, the nanoparticle nickel infiltration uh, in the fuel electrode. If we look at the performance characteristics, we can get high performance. High performance here demonstrates at a power density of 1.6 watts per square centimeter at 650C. Uh, as far as we know, that's, that's one of the records. Uh, it works in both modes very well. The area-specific resistance is 0.18. We've been targeting 0.2 uh, ohms square centimeter for the system, and we've demonstrated that at, the, at, at really button cell level. Uh, we have to do better uh, on the 600C uh, uh, polarization curve, if you will, that's getting uh, slightly higher, and we still uh, need better performance there. But most interestingly, I, I think one of the tests that we've been running uh, is on cycle durability. Uh, we, we need to cycle these things forward and backward, and no one has really tested this kind of technology in this mode. So we've looked here at uh, really one and 12 hour cycles. You can see a, a 30 minute operation on one mode, 30 minute operation on the other, switching back and forth between these modes uh, for different cycle times. So here is a one hour show, but we've also done 12 hour cycles in, uh, as well. So six hours in one mode, six hours in the other mode at different operating current densities. And what you'll notice here is on this light blue curve, if you're just operating electrolysis mode, you get fairly rapid degradation. Uh, but as we change into cyclic mode, we get reduced degradation as exhibited by the change in total resistance over time. And we've tested this for 1,000 hours. And as you can see, is once you get below a certain threshold operating current density, the degradation uh, mechanisms are turned off, essentially, or interrupted. And we find that that actually happens around 0.8 amps per square centimeter, which is at least twice as high or about twice as high as we think is economically needed uh, to develop the technology. So we're really encouraged uh, by these results in particular. In the remaining minutes, I, I'd like to give you a little snapshot of the economics when we first presented a couple years back. There were a lot of questions on that. We had no data. I can report some data uh, on this at this time. And that's unfortunate. This, uh, okay, I'm in IBM PC and, and these equations aren't, aren't showing up. But uh, what I would say is, briefly, there's a simple calculation that basically takes um, the, it, it takes the investment cost and divides by the energy storage and the round trip efficiency and the number of cycles. Uh, and you get essentially a simple storage cost metric um, in cents per kilowatt hour. The challenge with this method is it assumes a 100% capacity factor uh, in doing so. Uh, in order to uh, they'll perform this, we need to cost out the plant. So we've done some bottom-up plant costing using some of these uh, parameter values here, briefly highlighted here, uh, 250 megawatt rating. We've shown we can get higher round-trip efficiency, but we just put in 70% here. Uh, mature life pro projections for solid oxide cell technology. Again, we're using costs from solid oxide fuel cells. that are very applicable here, but perhaps not exactly applicable uh, depending on, uh, on the cell material sets. Uh, the storage, uh, there's a fair amount of good data here. Uh, we've been leveraging existing natural gas reservoir data from Lilitora facility in Denmark, 120 million uh, cubic meter uh, natural gas reservoir facility. Um, we make use of 70 million cubic meters of that. We need a 50 million cubic meter cushion gas uh, to support uh, the activity. And we've priced out uh, that cost uh, based on the existing cost that we know for that, that. And we've extrapolated for CO2 caverns. There, that's relatively unproven storage CO2. Uh, we've essentially taken the CH4 costs and more or less doubled them uh, for the risk. In the end, we get a capital cost at this scale of around less than $1,100 per kilowatt. Uh, if you look at the total expense breakdown up here, it's not uh, 
just capital costs. We got operating and maintenance costs here and, and staff and so forth uh, to operate. But in, in the end, uh, we're about 30% on, on the stack and less than 15% in the storage. This simple costing method then allows us to get us around three cents per kilowatt hour on storage costs with this method, which if you look, compares favorably against compressed air, air hydrogen, and, and pumped hydro in these other bulk storage categories. Um, we think that's uh, perhaps a little too simple and uh, more we could leverage instead um, the resources of this storage facility uh, using electricity uh, spot market prices and, and essentially uh, using supply and demand characteristics uh, of the uh, grid market and do essentially market arbitrage to buy and sell power, essentially buy power cheap, charge your system and sell it uh, when the price of electricity is high. Uh, so the, the cautionary uh, note here is uh, in making these calculations, of course, we knew what the prices were, it's historic prices, and we could optimize the sell-buy strategy, which then means um, this is really a maximum annual income estimate, okay? Uh, so if we look at 2008 electricity spot mar market prices, our colleagues at DTU really performed this study. Um, they used the Danish market uh, because that's what they were interested in at the time with our system. And uh, we don't get a capacity factor of 100% in this scenario. We get 61%. And uh, when you look at the life cycle cost, that raises it from almost $0.03 cents to almost $0.08. Cents. Uh, but you do get revenue from this, and you can drop that by 4% to a net overall storage cost of just under $0.04 cents at $0.3.7 cents per kilowatt hour. There is uh, lots of considerations that in the future, increasing renewable energy penetration will mean higher electricity price volatility, uh, and you could uh, essentially do more arbitrage uh, under those scenarios. With those scenarios, then, uh, there has been, uh, because... Denmark, in particular, is interested in 100% renewables integration uh, by 2035. Uh, they are very seriously looking at, then, the price impact on their markets, and they have done scenario forecasting. We've used those forecasts with the 2008 buy-sell hour uh, strategy, and we show that under that, and shown here in the red curve, is the buy-sell strategy and, and the price spot market prices that might be expected in the future with high penetration you could actually make money with electricity, electricity storage. Again, this is maximum, and of course there's lots of uncertainties here. But it does suggest that if you, even if you weren't perfect, you might end up as zero cost on storage. Okay, so to wrap up here, uh, the, we see that there are a lot of markets uh, that we could enter within this technology. Not only this so-called power gas platform, we can do bulk storage, and more recently within the project confines, we're turning now our attention to distributed uh, scale storage that will compete with advanced flow batteries and sodium sulfur batteries uh, in, in the kilowatt hour to low megawatt hour uh, ranges. There's a lot of work that certainly needs to be done yet. We need, really need to push the envelope on the operating temperature further with the LSGM technology. The results shown here are for small scale cells, okay, cells Gallup is always a challenge, uh, and that needs to be done. Uh, Long-term stability and durability testing, we have to operate in cyclic modes with the actual reactant gases we envision. And of course, if you're gonna run this thing up and down, you need to know something about the dynamics of the capability uh, of the system. So with that, I'd say we've learned a fair amount. We believe we can get fairly high round-trip efficiencies. Uh, we can even get above 80% if you can integrate thermally with uh, uh, nuclear or CSP, for example. Um, and regardless of, of how we, we estimate the economics, we think they're, much, uh, they're very attractive and can meet or exceed uh, the DOE targets. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, thank some of my collaborators and open it up for questions. Yeah, I have a question about uh, if you guys have any problems with cell. Sorry, here. Okay. <laughs> with Sorry. selectivity when you're running in electrolysis mode, 
to, uh, converting the CO2 to methane? Do you have any issues with making C2s or you know, products that you don't want? No, actually, the, the electrodes are catalytically active enough that they reach equilibrium rapidly with, with, uh, without even pulling out oxygen. When we pull out oxygen, obviously, we'll drive the equilibrium forward. Uh, but uh, we make methane and uh, uh, CO and H2 as exactly as you might predict uh, thermodynamically. Nice work, Rob. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, nice work. Uh, can you care about uh, a, a comment about the uh, the coking problem and whether you see it uh, uh, more in the in the electrolysis mode uh, than in the fuel cell mode? Well, that's a good question because as you move from electrolysis mode, you're, you're moving towards the coking boundary. Certainly one of the questions we have is, you know, the thermodynamics analysis, uh, you know, is nice and it provides, you know, insight and guidance on how to select conditions. But you really are dealing with local phenomena when you're flowing these uh, reactant gases through the passages of the cell. And if you don't have a, a good distribution, you, have, you could have locally rich uh, zones, so to speak, which could, could uh, uh, produce uh, carbon deposition, which would degrade performance. So, What's not so well known is what we would call the safety margin that would be required to, to push you away from that thermodynamic boundary. Uh, so what hydrogen and carbon ratio and what operating conditions would give you sufficient safety margin uh, to not coke up? So that, that will be revealed more in the cell testing. Uh, as a part of this project, we built a pressurized rig at Northwestern. Uh, and they're going to be uh, uh, operating under um, uh, syngas conditions at pressure and temperature. And that'll give us some better insight. Nevertheless, they're still fairly well mixed conditions under the lab, lab environment. The back so uh, how important it is to lower the operating temperature of these uh, devices? And what do you think is the main barrier uh, in that uh, direction of research? or how, how, to, how you think you can achieve that goal? Okay, so lowering the, the operating temperature really makes uh, more sense. So at the large bulk scale, we don't think we need that lower temperature at this point. Uh, but when we, look at, when we start turning towards distributed scale systems, you know, tens of kilowatts to hundreds of kilowatts or megawatt, uh, we, we think we'll, we'll have, we basically, in order to keep the cost low, we want to strip out a lot of that BOP equipment that we can. So we think we can get relatively simple and elegant designs. However, uh, we'd like to avoid pressurization in those situations as well. And so uh, shown here, for example, is a round trip efficiency versus stack temperature. We do have an expander included, but you can see that as we lower the stack temperature, we can get close to 78% round trip efficiency at 600 C for one of these small scale systems. Um, and we really think we need, you know, depending on whether or not you have the expander, uh, you're going to be closer to 70% efficiency if you don't, but you really need the 600C. The barriers are really the polarization resistances that are incurred. The, the, the resistances go up as you reduce temperature because the ionic connectivity of, uh, of the cell goes down. Uh, one of the strategies uh, could be to reduce um, the air electrode polarization resistance. Uh, we think they might be able to do that by doing uh, more um, nanoparticle infiltration on that electrode, just like has been, been doing on the fuel electrode with nickel, except it might be done with uh, Samaria, for example. One last question. Yeah. Quick question. Uh, you mentioned in your cost analysis uh, that your stack probably should last for at least five years. So could you explore a little bit and say why you believe it will be as long as five years? Yeah, we don't know how long it will be. Right now, um, what we see is after 1,000 hours in these small-scale cell tests, uh, virtually no degradation. Uh, the challenge is, of course, we have to operate on the carbonaceous fuel feedstocks we envision, and that hasn't been done over hours. The cycling doesn't seem at this point, okay, uh, it seems like it, it, it does have promise. Other solid oxide cell technology has been demonstrated uh, well past 20,000 hours, all the developers of that traditional uh, uh, focus in, in technology development um, are, are focused on increasing endurance. It's going to take certainly several years, I'm sure, to achieve that.
but that's economically what the target has been. Uh, some cells, like C old Siemens tubular cells, they lasted 70,000 hours, uh, but we think uh, 40,000 is where you're going to have to start to enter the marketplace that's real consistent with fuel cell technology.